2020 in what we're calling JLF at home. Mostly the overseas authors, as many of them may not be able to attend when we're able to present the physical festival. These sessions are exclusive for our valued ticket holders as a token of our gratitude for booking. But the recordings will be posted at a later stage for the wider audience. If you have any questions for the panelists, the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen can be used there. Please type in your questions and those questions will be posed to the interviewers at the, in the last 10 to 15 minutes of the uh, conversation. Please don't forget to watch your inbox, inbox for the next lot of webinars. And next week, we will be hosting a webinar on Wednesday, the 27th of May, as Thursday is Erev Shavuot. So we can't post, we can't do anything that evening. So please check your inbox for what is happening there. It's my great pleasure to introduce, partly, uh, because we're gonna have a longer introduction, the award-winning British author Thomas Harding, whose book Legacy, One Family, a cup of tea and the company that took on the world was voted book of the year by Financial Times and the Telegraph. He's in conversation with our very own Linda Hackner, who many of you will know from her wonderful work at the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center. Step back and enjoy. This is going to be a wonderful conversation. Hi everybody, good evening. I'm so delighted to be in conversation with Thomas Harding this evening. Uh, Thomas has written for the Financial Times, the Sunday Times, the Washington Post and the Guardian, amongst other publications. He has worked in visual media. He co-founded two that I know of, production companies, focusing on stories not generally covered by mainstream media. But for me, his greatest power lies in his magical skills as an author. We first met Thomas and I when he was in Cape Town for the Jewish Literary Festival, which, as you know, was then cancelled. But we were fortunate to have him speak at the Cape Town Holocaust and Genocide Center just before the lockdown, the Thursday before the lockdown, when he was talking about his masterful book, The House by the Lake, which tells of a hundred years of German history through the stories of five families who lived in the house that his paternal great-grandfather built. Tonight, we are going to be talking about legacy, one family, a cup of tea, and the company that took on the world, which is the story of his maternal great-great-great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents, great-grandparents, and grandparents. Unbelievable family history, which the Times Literary Supplement described as written with love and imagination, a master class in historical empathy. And really, if I could have said those words myself, <laughs> I wish I could have, I would have. Um, it, were, it is a superb, superb book. In the 1800s, Lemon Gluckstein and his family escaped the pogroms of Eastern Europe and made their way to Whitechapel in the East End of London. Starting by rolling cigars at their kitchen table, over three generations, the small tobacco sort of factory that he started became the largest catering company in the world, Lions Food Company. And I'm going to ask Thomas um, to please um, join me now in this conversation because I have to tell him a story before we start. So Thomas, are you there? Welcome, hello. Hi everybody, great, great Hi. to be here. It's so exciting to see everyone. It really is, is wonderful. And greetings from England, which is still daytime as you can see. Wonderful, you lucky fish, we're in the darkness here. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, I just want to tell you that your grand, great, great, great grandfather, was it three greats or four greats, Lehman Gluckstein, actually his life landed up affecting a young girl in Bulawayo, Rhodesia in 1966. How? 
Well, it turns out that your family created Lion's Made ice cream. Yeah, they did. And in Bulawayo, every Saturday morning, we would have Lion's Made hits <laughs> of the week. <laughs> where they would play the top ten, seven singles. <laughs> and if you were correct, if you could guess the top ten for the following week, you won a prize. You won five crisp one pound notes which they put in an envelope and posted to you by the way and it got to you i know because one day in 1966 i won wow and i got That's the fabulous one pound notes and i won um an lp by the beatles called revolver which i still have today and i have to mention my cousin basil miller because we did it together wow that's that's a, a wonderful story so, so Thomas, how does Lion's Maid get to Bulawayo in the 60s? Where does it all begin? How does it start? I'm asking you two questions in one. How does it start and what prompted you to tell the story of your really remarkable family? Well, thank you, everybody. And, it's, and thank you, Linda. Uh, I really, I miss being in Cape Town. And I was so sorry that we couldn't have the festival and meet in person. We obviously did, but everybody else and uh, I actually got on the last plane out of Cape Town before the lockdown. So uh, uh, I, I, I really feel very sad that I wasn't able to do this, but this is so wonderful having the opportunity to have this conversation tonight and discuss this book, which I feel so strongly about. So you asked me, how did it start, the book? So about four years ago now, I was walking through central London with my teenage daughter, Sam, and around Piccadilly Circus which is right at the heart of London, the most busy part of London. And we walked past a small little shop and I said, do you know what happened in this little shop? And she said, no. And I said, well, this is where the first Lion's Tea Room was, the tea shop. And she said, what tea shop? So I had to explain to her about the Lion's Tea Shops. And then we walked across Piccadilly Circus and across Piccadilly Circus, there was this huge building, like a whole block of the city. And I said, over here, uh, this building, this block, this huge block, Lions, my family built uh, this building and it was the largest hotel in Europe. And she's just started rolling her eyes at me. And then we walked across the Shaftesbury do. Avenue, as, as they do, up Shaftesbury Avenue, this enormous pink building, really derelict and bad shape. And there's arcades and it was not, hasn't been built for years. And I said, this is the Trocadero. And this also my family built. And this was the hub of cultural life in London back in the 1930s. And she said, what are you talking about? How is this possible? How come I don't know about this? Because, you know, in my family, I'd always been, we'd already spent time with my father's family, the Alexanders. Yes. Uh, yeah. They're the ones who came over from Berlin in the 1930s, mm. escaping mm. Nazi Germany. And I wrote two books about that. One was called Hans and Rudolf, and oh. the other one was House by the Lake. And that's mm. the one that I spoke to with you uh, mm. back in Cape Town. But that's my father's family. We're, they're the ones we used to hang out with in the weekends and anniversaries and bar mitzvahs and so on. My mother's family, for whatever reason, we didn't spend much time with. And I didn't really know the history of that. And my daughter was like, well, what's, what, what happened here? And I said, well, weirdly, I don't know. You know, when I was growing up, you know, uh, the only people I knew from that side of the family was my grandfather or my grandparents and my uncle and my kids. That was it. You know, if I... If I met these guys in the street, I wouldn't have recognized them, this huge family. The family was called the Salmons and the Glucksteins. They were really one family. Mm. And when I say one family, my, my grandfather's father, Isidore, he was one of 15 children. So he was a Salmon, Isidore Salmon. He was one of 15 children. Six very sadly died in childhood. Of the, of the nine that survived, seven married their first cousin. So when I say when I say one family, the Salmons and the Glucksteins really are interconnected, yeah, yeah. not two families. And uh, and so I decided, you know, maybe I should start investigating. I mean, there's one memory. I have one memory as a child because, as we'll probably talk about, this enormous food empire collapsed in the 1970s, and mm. that was I was born in 1968. So I didn't really remember. I I remember eating the products. I remember eating lines made ice cream like you do, or Swiss rolls, or Lion's Tea or Wimpy. That was one of the mm, brands. Wimpy. So I yes. remember all those things. Yeah. Uh, but I never really knew it was my mother's family. I do I have one memory, which was next to Piccadilly Circus, sorry, next to Marble Arch, there was a hotel called the Cumberland Hotel. Mm. And in Cumberland Hotel was a restaurant called the Carvery. 
-hmm. And this is one of the first places that you could serve unlimited amounts of meat and so on. So I went in there was about seven or eight with my grandfather, Sam, Salmon. And I remember going in there and there's plush uh, red velvet chairs and white linen tablecloths and men walking around with white hats. And my big memory is this guy, this chef or this waiter with a white hat pushing this trolley around with, uh, with desserts. And there was trifles and there was cakes and there was pies and there was tarts and there was jellies. And my grandfather said, imagine this, like I'm seven or eight years old, eat as much as you like. Imagine that as a child. What, what, I know, it's so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. What he didn't say was that his family, our family owned the business. You know? mm-hmm. So I never knew that growing up. So when I walked around central London talking to my daughter, that was really the moment was like, maybe I should find out about it. It'd be really interesting. And that started my journey. Mm-hmm. You know, how did this business start? Who were the main characters? Yeah. What was the impact on society? Not just yeah. in Britain, but around the world. And then also, yes. how did it end? How did it end? Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, Thomas, uh, just so wonderful to hear you talking about this and how you came to it, and and the fact that you had actually eaten in one of these restaurants you didn't know you your family owned. Mm-hmm. Um, but there, there's certain. I mean, every single character in this book. I don't know how you how you do it. But I have to tell you, listeners, that, that or viewers, whatever, people, participants, that Thomas, he writes, I read the book over two days, and it's a tome. It's a tome. But I became so invested in every single character, because each one is drawn so beautifully with all their wonders and all their foibles, but the one that I was drawn to initially, of course, was Lehman Gluckstein, because yeah. he was the one who came up with the notion, if I'm not mistaken, and correct me because I might be, of the fund. No, so that, you're, you're, I mean, that, that's was not that quite Monty? right. So that's was Monty. That Monty. So I can te- let me okay. tell you about Monty. So Monty, okay. so let's well, there's a lot Monty. of characters. So the yes. story is over 150 years. Yes. So there's many characters. Yeah. And it's really yeah. worth telling British history, global history over 150 years and five generations. Yeah. So I'm not surprised. Absolutely. You know, yeah, that, I, that, that I'm easy to mix up. And there's a lovely family <laughs> tree at the beginning <laughs> to, yeah. to do that. But so Monty, so Monty Jackson, so, so Monty Gluckstein. So what happened was the family came over from Prussia, effectively, yes. yeah. uh, to England in 1843. And they're running away from pogroms and anti Semitism yeah. and economic strife. Mm-hmm. And they ri- arrived in East London, as you said, with nothing. They had no mm-hmm. money, no nothing. And Monty's father, Samuel, arrived and he said, what am I going to do? I don't know anybody. So he started rolling cigars. He learned how to roll cigars. He made one cigar, then two cigars, and soon he was selling them on the streets and he was, he was doing really well. And by 1870, he had a, a, a business with, a, with his brother and his brother-in-law. And then they got themselves into trouble and his brother and brother-in-law took him to court, the high court in London. And this is the big trauma of the family which Mm. kind of creates, this is the engine which pushes Mm. everything forward. Mm. And interestingly enough, back a hundred years later in the 1960s, when the family had all sorts of trouble, they brought the Tavistock Institute in to discuss some of these issues. And this trauma comes in and they discuss it. And what happened was that the brother and brother-in-law said that Monty, who's the Steve, the Steve Jobs of the family, the entrepreneur, and Natasha, I don't know if you've got a picture of of Monty to show everybody. he, he, the brother and the brother-in-law accused Monty of stealing the insurance bond from the safe there, and also, oh, and of bullying yeah. the staff. There you go. There's Monty. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes. There we go. There's there. Monty. There and he was, he yeah. was a short fella and yeah. uh, they took him to court and then he countersued and said that, and this was all in public and, and, and Monty, who was 15 years old at the time, was there to witness the trial at the high court. And uh, his father, Samuel, countersued and said that his brother and brother-in-law uh, had got it totally wrong and that his brother-in-law had sexually assaulted Samuel's mm-hmm. teenage daughter, Monty's mm-hmm. sister. Mm-hmm. Can you imagine? This is just right. dreadful. Uh, and this is all in public yeah. and very humiliating. Mm-hmm. So Monty then comes back to his brothers and his brother-in-laws. This is Monty, the, the, younger, the younger guy. He's 15 years old and uh, says, we've got to do something about this. And um, 
about two or three years later, Samuel dies. Monty says later of a broken heart. He found this whole thing so stressful, this, this, um, this humiliation in public. And, and Monty gets everybody back together again and says, look, we have to do something. We can't never let this happen again. The most important thing is unity. We have to always stay together. This is going to be our strength. And he comes up with this idea, this clever idea of what he called the fund. And the idea was that from that point on, everybody who wanted to, um, who agreed at the beginning, who said, yes, I'm part of it, uh, they would share all their income. Everybody would get the same income. So all their income would go in a pot, all the profits, and they would share equally. Even more radically, the idea was that all the assets would be shared as well so that no one got a, a horse and cart until everybody got a horse and cart. No one got a house until everybody got a house. It all happened at the same time. And they didn't own anything individually. It was the fund which owned everything together. And this, this you can imagine, is a great force for unification, but also a driving force for entrepreneurship. And this drove the business, this drove the family for 100 years from the late 19th century through the two world wars and into the 20th century. And it was, and an it was sort of the bundle of sticks notion. Yeah, so they, they used the Aesop fable idea that, you know, if you, it's quite easy to break one, bun, one stick, but if you made them into a bundle, it's much more difficult to break them. And that was their, on their coat of arms, that was their logo, their brand was the bundle of sticks. Mm. Uh, and they used to um, tell the men, when the young men, when they joined the fund, because every man when he was 21, 23, from the family would join the fund, these, these stories. Importantly, though, the women were not invited to join the fund. And this, for one, this becomes later a real source of contention. At the beginning, not so much, because Monty's sister, Lena, was very much part of the early business. She was very much a, a partner. In fact, she was the one, uh, I guess I should keep going and explain what happened with the catering business. So rather than jumping around a bit. So in the 1880s, uh, 80s, 1890s, Monty's going around Britain and he's selling the businesses cigars. They're doing really well selling cigars, then they're selling pipes and then they're selling cigarettes. And the biggest business of tobacco is one of the biggest tobacco businesses in Europe. It's, it's the biggest in Britain of retail outlet. They ever had over 140 tobacconists. It was called Salmon and Gluckstein's. Uh, Mark Karl Marx used to buy his cigars from uh, Sam and Gluckstein. So, so Monty used to go around to the various conferences and he noticed something that at these places, these conferences, the exhibitions where he used to sell cigars, he noticed that the food and the drink was terrible. You know, all you could get was alcohol and really stale pastries. He came back and he said, hey guys, I've got an idea. Why don't we sell tea and coffee and light fare at these exhibitions? No one else is doing it. Why don't we have a go? And his brother-in-law, Barnett Salmon, said, no, we don't want to do that. We, we're in the tobacco business. You know, we don't want to you know, dilute our brand. Um, and Monty said, no, no, I really want to do this. I really want to do this. Uh, I think it's a great idea. And Barnett says, well, there's two conditions. One is you can't use any of the people in, in the family. And two is you can't use our name. Uh, mm -hmm. And Monty was like, okay, that's fine. I'll, I'll do that. I'll come up my own name. I'll get my own people. So Monty goes around and he sets up his own business. And now he needs a name. And he thinks, I want a name which is, there's a lot of anti-Semitism at the time. There's a lot of anti-German feeling. So he wants an English sounding name, Anglo sounding name. And he remembers that there's a friend of the family who he knows about. And this guy's got the gift of the gab. He can sell snow to the Eskimos. He's, he's not a business person. But he, he's a salesman. He'd be a really good front, front man. And also, he has a really good name. Excellent. And his name was Joseph Lyons. Joseph Lyons, which becomes shortened to Joe Lyons, Jay Lyons, and also Lyons. Mm -hmm. And that becomes the start of this catering empire, which first of all starts selling tea and coffees and cakes at exhibitions. And then they started doing it. They started doing catering for um, exhibitions in London. And then they ran their own exhibitions. And then eventually... They came up with this idea of tea shops, you know, a place where particularly women. So at the end of the 19th century, it sounds strange now, but re women really weren't, it wasn't permissible. It wasn't polite. It wasn't proper for women, middle class women to eat out in public. So there was, there was chop houses and there was taverns and there was inns, but they were all rowdy and boisterous and alcohol. And, uh, you know, it wasn't a safe place. 
And so the idea is you have these tea rooms where women could come, have their tea with their friends, have a cake, maybe before they go to theater or after they've been shopping. And this became a huge success. And the first one, Natasha, I think there's a, a picture of the first one on Piccadilly Circus, a 213 Piccadilly Circus, which was set up in the end of the 19th century. And going back to Elena, Monty's, Monty's sister, she was the one who negotiated all the contracts. She was, yes. she was an incredibly good businesswoman. So she would find the property, she would negotiate the contracts. Uh, she was known in the family as being incredibly frugal. Uh, so much, I, I, I want to tell you a funny story about Lena. So, because I think it's important to tell some of these stories about the women. Because, you know, in history, I think sometimes the women get forgotten, don't they? And so I want to tell a story about Lena. So uh, she was known in the family as being very frugal. And uh, one day, one of her sister-in-law said, look, Lena, you have to go and get yourself a new hat. This is ridiculous. Oh, Buy yourself a new hat. You know, you haven't worn the same hat for years. It's oh, falling apart. It's coming apart. She said, okay, I'll go and get a hat. So she goes to the hat shop, the milliners, and it probably in some very you know, fancy shop. And she's going around. And eventually the woman who runs the shop says, can I help you, madam? And, and, and she said, no, don't worry about it. And she finds a hat, she puts it on her head and she tries another hat, she, she's not sure. And then she puts her own hat on. And the woman comes back and says, madam, you know that your hat is the wrong way around. And this is her old hat, the one that she'd been told was looking terrible. So she turns her hat around and she looks in the mirror and it's like, oh, that looks kind of good. And she leaves the shop. Because her view is, <laughs> that's right. So that's the kind of the idea. That's what she was like. Lena was always about saving a few pounds or a few shillings. And, uh, you know, that was the way that they ran the company. So very frugal, very prudent. And one shop became two shops, became five shops, became 200 shops. And they were all over the country. And they became known as a place of quality. One of the things about these shops was it was for the masses. It wasn't for the posh people. It wasn't for the rich people. It was for the everyday person who wanted a reliable source, a reliable place to get a, a cup of tea and coffee or a cake or a sandwich. And the important thing about this was that every shop had the same food. Every shop had the same menu. And this is the first time in this country, in Britain and in Europe, where you'd have, it was a chain restaurant. Was it was a chain, chain restaurant. It's the first yeah. time. So now it's very common. This is not surprising. But back then, if you had an, somebody who owned a few restaurants, each one would have their own menu, their own prices. Yeah. Jay Lance was the first place where you could buy the same thing in the same shop around. And the way they did that is they centralized production. So they had this place called Cadby Hall in West London where they made their cakes, they made their pies, and then they would distribute them to the various shops. And this became a template for you know, all the brands that we know today. And by the middle of, well, by, between the two wars, by 1920s, early 1930s, they became the largest catering company in the world. Because now they not just had tea shops, they had these things called corner houses, which was almost like shopping malls. It was eight or 9,000 people eating together in a variety of different restaurants, but in one building. They were called corner houses because they were on the corner of two different shops. Uh, and then they had you know, these iconic brands like Nippies, for example, which is, by well, the way, that's the song. I to ask you about. Um, so the song that we were listening to when, when it started yeah. was from a musical about these tea houses, these corner houses with the nippies. Tell us about the nippies and well, I mean, who traded them and what they wore and why they wore what they wore, etc. And how they were part of the whole thing. Well, I mean, the, the Jay Lyons by that stage, by the mid 20s, early 30s, was so enormous. It had such an impact on society that these they became cultural icons, the tea shops first of all, then the corner houses, but then the waitresses themselves became iconic. And they were called nippies and they would wear these, there, there's a picture, they, they wear these black outfits with these white hats. And uh, they were known for their great service and their good um, uh, personalities. Uh, and they were much beloved in, in uh, the country. So much so that uh, the name nippy was trademarked and it became, you can look up, in the Oxford English Dictionary under Nippy, you'll find the word Nippy. And then there was a musical which was written about Nippies with a love story and there's a kind of a triangle. And that was called Nippy. And that was the music that some of us heard while we were waiting for this um, webinar today. Uh, and, th and this shows you really how this uh, family, it's really interesting to me, this family which was 
only about 80 years from arriving literally on the boat, these Jewish German immigrants mm. who were very much considered outsiders, who experienced profound anti-Semitism and anti-German anti, uh, uh, sentiment, xenophobia. Within 70, 80 years, this business that they'd created and the various brands and products were very much taken over by Britain. They were very much British ideas. So the association with Britain and tea, for example, you can largely thank Lyons, you know, this idea of the Blitz spirit and drinking a cup of tea and getting through it. And that's all related. Obviously, there's other sources, but to, to Jay Lyons. Uh, mm. So on the one hand, they did really well to assimilate. But then on the other hand, they came up, they came across a lot of issues. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted to talk to you about their role, both in the First World War yeah. and feeding, feeding the army. And the Second World War. Can you can you talk about that a little for us? Yeah. So this is. I, I mean, I had no idea about any of this. So in the First World War, a lot of the the men, the sons, was, went off to fight, uh, mm. as was expected, and the women then um, stayed back and they took the men's jobs and they worked, running the business, keeping you know, making the coffee. And there's wonderful pictures of these women making the coffee or you know making the tea, uh, of delivering to the various shops around the country. And then in the Second World War, uh, the same in terms of the men going off and the women saying back. But there was something else that happened, which, again, I mean, when I say this, it, it blew my mind. I'm wondering how you guys are going to react. Mm. But uh, in about 1940, uh, Churchill began to realize that they were way behind in terms of armaments. They hadn't kept up with the Germans. There'd been this whole pacifist move off the First World War. They had to really catch up quickly. Uh, if they were going to fight Germany. And so he went, Churchill asked various private organizations to help with arming mm. the, uh, the country. And one yeah. of them was Jay Lyons. And they asked uh, various members of my family, including my grandfather, to come in for a meeting in Whitehall. And uh, they had no idea what the meeting was for. And this kind of, this, uh, this man, this civil servant said, look, we, we've got, we would need your help. And they said, okay, you know, expecting they would say, going to say, we help, help with the, I don't know, with the catering or help with the, I don't know, the food. And they said, no, no, we want you to start making bombs for us. And they're like, what are you talking about making bombs? He said, well, we figure that if you can make Swiss rolls and you can make bread, you can follow a recipe. Goodbye. So, all, you know, making bombs is your, all you have to do is follow a recipe. So they, they said, okay, I guess we could. So they, were asked to set up this place called Elsto, which is a, a very large bomb making factory. They built it from scratch, mostly again, staffed by women, local women who had, they had to train how to make bombs. At first they made very small bombs, they got bigger and bigger and bigger. Linda, if I tell you by the end of the Second World War, this one factory uh, produced one seventh, one seventh of all the bombs dropped by Britain on Germany. It's extraordinary. It is extraordinary. And, and I want to just um, move in here with something. Uh, uh, this is a right wing pamphlet that was written at the time. Yeah. That goes, who is head of the army? A Jew, Hor Belisha. Who clothes the army? A Jew, Montague Burton. Who feeds the army? A Jew, Isidore Salmon. Yeah. Better join the Navy. Yeah. So despite all of this, there's still that sense of, well, there's still anti-Semitism. How did it affect your family? I know, for instance, that Isidore became Sir Isidore. Yeah. Salmon. He was knighted. He was, in, in, he was a member of parliament. He was yet still. Can you talk about that? And, and um, can you talk about those two ships? Because that, when I read about that, it broke my heart. And yeah. it broke yours as well. So... Well, let me talk about Isidore. So this is my great grandfather, my grandfather's father. And uh, he was, you know, he was totally different from Monty. Monty was the, you know, he was this entrepreneur, as I said. Isidore was more a, a technocrat. He would get things done. He would work so hard. Um, and he was known for that. And by the early 1930s, he was now running the company. And... Uh, he was also very senior in the board of deputies of Jews. Um, and so he had a very senior position there. So he was getting all the intelligence coming from Germany. And uh, in 1933, at the, in the end of 1933, 
uh, just before Christmas, they opened their latest hotel called the Cumberland Hotel. It's the same hotel I talked about earlier where the carvery was. Huge hotel. This was now the biggest in Europe. The king and the queen came to open it up and they had this gala dinner, this huge dinner with the great and the good, 300 guests, you know, the captains of industry and the barons of the media. And at the end of the meal, uh, the person who owned the Daily Mail and the Daily Mirror, the two huge newspapers in Britain, stood up. His name was Viscount Rothermere, and he had a champagne glass in his hand. You know as they do it. And he said, you know, give a big toast, uh, celebrating the hotel and the, this family, the Salmon Rocksteins. And he particularly said, I want to I celebrate Isidore Salmon, you know, for his huge achievement. And he put them and to Isidore, and 300 people were like, to Isidore. It was wonderful. Yeah. Two weeks later, two weeks later, uh, is it, uh, Viscount Rothermere wrote an article in the Daily Mail and the Daily Mirror uh, under his own name. I don't know, Natasha, if you could put this one up, this picture. And this article, this, this headline said, hurrah for the black shirts. Hurrah for the black. This is the same man, Viscount Rothermere, two weeks after he toasted Isidore Salmon, one of the most uh, uh, celebrated Jewish businessmen in the country. And Isidore was so up. I mean, you can imagine. Isidore felt betrayed and upset. And over the next, I mean, I didn't really know much about the history of the black shirts. I mean, I'd done a lot of work about in Germany and the Nazis and National Socialism. I didn't really know much about the black shirts in Britain. Mm -hmm. Well, in 1934, over those six months, they received, attracted an enormous amount of support. Over 50,000 paid up members. Some of the biggest names in British society supported them. They were really getting traction and, and the British police were really worried about this. Uh, and they, they, they wore the same black shirts and they were, they, he, Oswald Mosley, who ran the uh, British, mm -hmm. Union of Fascist, British Union of Fascists, BUF, uh, he called his stormtroopers the SS. I mean, and they said the most awful things and they went after Isidore, their magazine called, creatively enough, Black Shirt. <laughs> uh, they went after Isidore Salmon and, and various mm -hmm. other leaders of the Jewish community. Uh, six months later, they have a huge rally just next to the factory where my family made their cakes and their ice creams and, and their breads um, in West London, Cadby Hall. And the, they had their big celebration, their big rally at what was called Olympia, which is huge, a huge assembly hall. Over 15,000 of these black shirts were inside and there was some outside and a bunch of uh, Jewish activists were outside and there was fighting and the black shirts were beating people up and they had weapons and it was a, it was the worst street fighting scene in a generation the next day the british media really criticized oswald mosley surprisingly they really came out against hmm. and isidore thought okay this is my moment i should do something about this hmm. uh, and the thing is it's worth thinking about this it wasn't an obvious decision you know, yeah. first of all, yeah. my family, I think like many Jewish families, they want to keep their head below the parapet. Don't yeah. cause a fuss, don't, cause, don't yeah. attract attention. Yeah. 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 Uh, they were still very much saw themselves as immigrants, even though they'd been in the country for 70 years. Mm. Uh, they were still saw themselves as outsiders. And more importantly, he was very worried because there was so much anti-Semitism in the country. There was so much xenophobia and support for the fascists. He thought, if I come out against Oswald Mosley, then people are going to come out against lions. You know, yeah. that's a really yeah. a serious co yeah. consideration. Yeah. 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 Maybe better just to, you know, not say anything. He incredibly bravely, and I had no idea about this story, he incredibly bravely said he's going to do something about it. So he tracked down Viscount Rothermere, the owner of the Daily Mail and Daily Mail, the guy who'd done the toast. And he tracks him down. He says, look, you, I'm going to give you a choice. Either yeah. you, you, you keep supporting Oswald Mosley, and I'm going to, or I'm going to, um, I'm going to pull out my advertising for your newspapers. Yeah. You have to understand that Lions was the, one of the biggest advertisers at that time. Yeah. One of the newspapers, one of the editions, before, just before that, Lions had taken out 25% of all the pages, a quarter of the entire newspaper on one of the issues. You know, they were a huge advertiser. Mm -hmm. And uh, Rothermere made his decision and he immediately withdrew support from Oswald Mosley. Mm -hmm. Oswald Mosley later admitted that this is what happened. And yeah. because of this, it pulled all the oxygen away from the British Union of Fascists. Yeah. And that's probably one of the reasons that the fascists didn't get as far as they did in other countries. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that, that's an it also had story. other it also had other effects about um, Jewish people behind the press or managing the press, et cetera, et cetera. There were those kinds of things also, weren't there? Anti Semitic yeah. sort of comments. Yeah, exactly right. And you asked about these ships. So, you know, a uh, hundred right. years after they arrived in the in the country, yeah. uh, uh, those two German ships, the two largest German ships whose names I can never remember. And yeah, I'll, I'll give you them good. to you in a second. There's two huge, <laughs> yeah. one was a battleship and one was, you know, an, an enormous ships. And they had these complicated German names. And because I, like everybody else, can never say their names, they're these German names. And Britain was desperate to stop them because they were the ones who are managing the blockade. Yeah. The ones in, in the North Sea, they were stopping food uh, and other materials coming, coal and everything else were yeah. coming from the, from South Africa, from Australia, from India, from North America, coming to Britain. So um, Britain desperately wants to stop these ships and eventually they manage to blow them up. But throughout this whole period, because British people can't say like myself, complicated German names, these two ships were known as the Salmon and the Gluckstein. Mm -hmm. Imagine that a hundred years after they've been in the country, the family who wants to be more British than the British, who's now sent their children to Cambridge University, you know, mm -hmm. some of them are knighted and they've, the, uh, the family is, is providing tea and garden parties yeah. for the queen yeah. at the Buckingham yeah. Palace. Yeah. Still considered outsiders, German Jews, publicly, even yeah. 100 years later. And, and with that, I want to quote from your book where you said, uh, Isidore believed himself to be a part of the in-group. Yeah. Um, Londoners born and raised, owners of a British company, employing British people, selling British goods to British citizens loyal to king empire and all it stood for his yeah. religion was judaism but he was british through and through and that's how he felt but unfortunately not how he was seen and not how he ever would be seen i just want to at this point apologize to everybody if you're hearing snoring in the background it's my king Charles <laughs> daniel he's, he's just i thought it was your husband no, no, no. He's, he's not. It's my dog. So if it's disturbing people, I really apologize. I don't know what to do with him, but he's, he's sleeping soundly. <laughs> so, yeah, so that, that idea of you try and you try and you try and it's still not there. But I don't know if, if the participants know that your family catered for the Buckingham Palace garden parties. Right. Your family catered for Wimbledon. I mean, it was a huge British kind of um, institution, huge. So, so, uh, and so uh, then, of course, into the empire. So I was going to say, so after the Second World War, they really expanded around the world. Yeah. And uh, they started their brands. They started you know, their mm. breads, lion's bread, mm. lion's coffee, lion's tea. They had a tea plantation in Niazaland, uh, Malawi. Yes. Malawi. They had a yeah. tea packing plant in South Africa, a huge tea mm. packing plant. Uh, uh, and in India and Canada. I mean, they sold their brands all over the world. And then in 1950s, they were approached by this North American who said, look, I've got a hamburger chain I'm interested in moving and, and expanding. He had only, I think, 10 or 11 of these uh, his things. This is 10 years before McDonald's came to Europe. Mm -hmm. And my family was, oh, we're not sure. They're a bit posh. You know, we're not sure. It's a bit kind of below us but he really persuaded them and then they tried it out and they sold tens of thousands of burgers when they tried it out and they thought, okay, we should do this. So they then launched this, this uh, network of hamburger joints, as I said, 10 years before McDonald's arrived. Um, and they named it Wimpy. And mm. of course, Wimpy was around Britain and around Europe and then it came to South Africa. And as mm. I understand it, Wimpy is a, you know, it's huge mm. in South Africa. Yes, still today. And so that's our fam. You're welcome, by the way. <laughs> <That's our fam. laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so then, um, so then by the 1960s, you know, they're, they're, they are an enormous catering empire. Mm -hmm. But now you've got this tension between the young generation and the old generation. And by that yes. stage, my grandfather, Sam, was the, was the chairman of the company. Now, the, you have to understand the only merit, the only credential for him being chosen as chairman, it wasn't his qualifications, his experience. He was the oldest. That was the only reason that they became chairman. Well, hardly, hardly the criteria for, uh, for being chosen to run one of the largest businesses in the world. Good. And of course, that's a problem. And uh, it meant that's that- That's how it had always been. How, and it worked until you got to the 1960s. 
I yes. think that there's a lot of pressures. And then the younger generation, they they wanted to modernize and they wanted to get with it. And so that generation was kind of pushed out. And mm. the next generation came up and there's one guy called Neil, one of my cousins took over with some of his cousins. Mm. And their whole idea is we're not big enough. Even though we're big, we're not big enough. And so they wanted to be like the Americans. They wanted to conglomeratize, like bring in other businesses. So their specialty was food, but let's bring in some other things, um, other businesses. And so they started buying businesses wherever they could, left and right. They bought Tetley Tea, the whole of Tetley Tea. They bought meat packing plants. They bought um, slaughterhouses and they bought uh, Baskin and Robbins ice cream, the biggest, biggest ice cream business in the world. Yeah. They bought Dunkin' Donuts. I mean, they went, they went absolutely nuts. Crazy. Which was yeah. great until it wasn't. And then in the 1970s, uh, when the UK pound collapsed yes. in the mid-1970s, they, uh, they yeah. suddenly couldn't afford to pay the interest rates anymore. Yeah. And yeah. within an incredibly short time, mm. they went bust. And they had to sell the business for almost nothing. Yeah. And so by the time I was you know, growing up and I could remember anything, the family yeah. didn't own anything, much of any. anything. No, yeah. no. So an incredible and, and I, shift. It's in your, your book that you write at the end, I think, clogs to clogs in three generations. It right. takes three generations to build and lose. So in our case, it was five generations, but exactly right. It was, it was, yeah. it was a bit longer, but exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But I want to go back because I'm still interested. The ice cream for me is a big issue. Sure. Okay. <laughs> Because your company created Mivies and those were my favorite yeah. ice cream. Tell, tell me about why you like Mivies so much. Because they had Mivies. If anyone's from what was Rhodesia, you'll remember Mivies. They were, it was like creamy ice cream, but it was enrobed in like a strawberry nice. ice. It, it was beyond. I loved Mivies. Okay. So, so but... It was Isidore who, who went to find out how to make ice cream, didn't he? And how to create it. Because nobody kind of really, I think it was you and walls. Well, not you, but, you know, lions and walls. But to get the, the, um, the sort of the science of ice cream. And one well, of the scientists was a young woman named Margaret, Margaret Thatcher. So, no, so one of the interesting things thing. is between, this, between the wars, there really hasn't, wasn't an ice cream business after yes. the First World War. There was yes. kind of, people would sell little ice cream pops Funny from, things, their, yeah. from their trolleys. Yeah. And there was issues yeah. of health and safety yeah. and so on. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, so what my family did is they came up with this idea of a food laboratory. This is really the first people who did this. And they brought food scientists together with technicians. And they were real boffins. They liked to experiment and come up with ideas. Mm -hmm. At one stage, my great grandfather sent my grandfather Sam to America to see if he could get a new flavor. And he went to a very famous American ice cream company and tasted their chocolate ice cream. He said, Oh, we, we need some of this. But of course, back then there was no airplanes, you couldn't travel overseas. So he had to pack it with ice and in an urn and, and, and blankets and so on and put it, took a ship, a railway, and then a ship and a railway. And three weeks later, he arrived back and actually the ice cream was still. Frozen. frozen and they tried it and they're like this is fantastic so they started making chocolate ice cream and they came up with these amazing different flavors and you know yeah. frozen and juice from a stick like orange made and, orange made and soft served yeah. ice cream yeah and you're yeah. right margaret thatcher she worked in the ice cream yeah. laboratory yeah. Uh, yeah yeah the other thing the I mean, they, they, they were always inventing stuff so in the 19 after the second world war they had always been committed to uh automation of clerical work so counting machines and so on and mm. and uh and so when they heard that there was this new thing called the computer being developed in america they really wanted to find out about it so they went to america and they learned yeah. some stuff and they came back and together with cambridge university they developed the prototype for the world's first i'm not kidding the world's mm. first business computer yeah. And they came up with this prototype and it started doing um, calculations and they were able to pay the payroll from the world's first business computer. And so then they went to the business of making computers and uh, they sold them to Ford and to Shell Oil and to the government and the post office. And then by the mid 60s, you know, they just couldn't compete with IBM. Mm. And so they yeah. ended up selling yeah. it off. But, you know, this was the kind of things they would just try things. Yeah. Because, you know, <laughs> we need we need automation of clerical work. Yeah. yeah. And Thomas, I want to go back to the fund because I just yeah. wanted to, the one story that, that sort of stands out for me is that if, if one got, then everybody got. Yes. And at one point, everybody was going to receive a new horse and carriage yes. with a liveried driver. 
So in order that nobody should feel that anybody is above anybody else, they all sort of arrived at each house at the same time yeah. and rang the doorbell at the same time. So nobody got their horse and carriage <laughs> before anybody else. I think this is, I just find, you know, the fund for me is a very, it's very emotional because I think it's a very beautiful thing. It is a beautiful thing. It it's is a beautiful, a beautiful thing. thing because it's about family and it's about not putting anybody above anybody else. And yes, this guy might be cleverer and could earn more, but this guy's part of the family and needs to be. And, needs and also, to the idea was that if, if 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 someone died, then the widow would get the, the, the person's widow was salary and the capital. Of, the family absolutely. was in some way, you know, less able. They would get the same as yeah. everybody else. Yeah, I mean. Yeah. But within it, but Linda, within it, there was also weaknesses and flaws and tensions. So I think one of the reasons that you could argue that the company fell apart for the family was they had a small pool of talent, you yes. know, towards the end. And one of the reasons they did that for themselves is they cut out 50% of the potential people who could work there, which was women. So yes. stupidly, yes. idiotically, yes. women, none of the female members of the family worked for the business. They weren't part of the fund. In fact, there was this weird family tree. You know, family trees, they have like, you know, there'd be one line and then, then the next descendants and then the next line, the, you know, the, like a scaffolding. Well, I found one of these for the family, but it was for the fund. And then like some kind of thing from, uh, you know, uh, some dystopian future. Mm. The only people on this paper were men. Men. You know, 54 mm. men because it was mm. for the fund. And obviously, mm. you know, I mean, that might work for Margaret Atwood book, but you know, in real life, that's a terrible idea. So I think in some ways, the, the, there was deep flaws within the fund. Another flaw was, you know, by the 60s and 70s and 80s, some of the younger members were Didn't saying, you? well, hold on a second, I work my butt off. And there's other people who are not working very hard, they're getting the same as me, mm. you know, and what that, that doesn't sound really fair. Uh, and so, but you'd get these kind of these constant tensions and what had been a, a, a unific, unifying drive became a straitjacket for many of them. So by yeah. the end of the 80s, 10 years, after the, 10 years after the business collapsed, they started talking about dissolving the fund. Yes. And that was incredibly contentious because the younger members were, also felt loyalty to their ancestors, you know. And the idea was that they weren't meant to ever own the capital it was always the idea was that it would be passed down the generation so there was a lot of hand wringing and a lot of kind of arguing it was really really difficult but they mm. came up to a resolution and yeah. so in the early 90s they were able to dissolve the funds dissolve spread the wealth around you and know, amazing I, enough the family is still talking to each other which is wonderful amazing yeah. but i do think that the notion of the fund being male only um in the early days yeah. the early in the 1800s, early 1900s, you can understand that because that was the zeitgeist. That was the way people thought. I think post-World War II, had they opened it up a little, once the women had, I mean, women had been at the front lines in the sure. workforce. So, yeah, yeah. I mean, my mother's generation, my mother really upset and other people in her yeah. generation. And yeah. it wasn't just that they were excluded. They would inherit, you know, maybe a small amount if they married, but that yes. small amount was then managed in a trust by the brothers or their fathers. Yes. One of the people who was really upset by the system was a, was a, a cousin of my grandfather's uh, yeah. who was bought, her bought, birth name was Hannah, Hannah Gluckstein. But then when she, she started working professionally as a painter, she changed yeah. her name to Gluck. And Gluck. some of you may have heard of this, this woman. She's maybe one of the most famous early 20th century painters. And her work now is really uh, valued. And she was furious, furious that how she was treated by her brother and her father, how she was excluded. And I think that was one of the driving forces towards her journey in life. Mm. Uh, which I think is, you know, really but interesting. I mean, Gluck was really an alternative uh, woman. She, yeah. she wore her hair cut like a man. She wore men's suits at a time when women yeah. just didn't do Do we have a picture stuff. of Natasha? Do we have a picture uh, of Gluck maybe that we can Gluck. share people? Yeah. yeah. So she, and she had a, her, you know, her lover. She yeah, she was amazing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so she, she, she had a very tortured romantic life with this mm -hmm. woman called Nesta. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, there, she, she did a picture called, there you go, there, of the medallion. So Gluck medallion. is at the front. Yeah. This is called medallion and uh, Nestor is the back. And yeah. 
uh, this is you know quite a famous picture now and you can see she was very striking and strong yeah. and yeah. i mean the, her, her artwork is extraordinary really beautiful yeah. and there's been a series I mean, of exhibitions really, at the tate gallery really in london pushed against things thomas things that really in in the day people just didn't understand and didn't accept and she really had to fight for her place in the world gluck yeah. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. I mean, my mother said she was quite difficult as well. And so, you know, she would she would always be invited to family events and never turn up. So, you know, there's, there's I think she was yeah. a, quite a, a, a tricksy personality, mm. uh, as well as being an extraordinary artist uh, in yeah. very difficult circumstances. Yeah. And I don't think the family did her many favours, although, you know, she was probably able to paint because of the wealth that she inherited from the family. So... Yeah. She in some ways, she you know she benefited from the Samuel yeah. Blockstein. She did. Uh, she had, benefited yeah. from the fun. She didn't have to marry to right. be supported or work or yeah. yeah, yeah. I'm just looking to see if there's anything else that I I wanted to mention. Well, um, should we maybe? There's some questions. Should we yeah. have a look at? Should we go to the questions? Let's go to Q and A. I'm going to have a look at the questions here. Um, are you related to the late Joe and Goldie Gluckstein? So where are you reading that? Is that in the Q&A tab? Is it, are people, can, people, Q &A can, people, can people ask other questions if they yes. add it to the Q&A? Okay, yeah, so if you'd like to ask questions, please ask. But this one is, are you related to the late Joe and Goldie Gluckstein? You know, I don't know. Uh, I've never heard of Joe and Goldie. I may well be. So when I started yeah. this whole adventure, I knew about, I don't know, maybe five or six members of the family. And I now know 60 or 70. And, uh, but Jody and Go unfortunately, Joe and Gold uh, Goldie aren't one of them, but maybe, you know, who knows? You never know. Have a look. Are there still Lions Tea Shops in London? No, there are not Lions Tea Shops. Um, they tried to resurrect it in the 80s. There aren't any left. Uh, there are lots of brands. So, for example, Lions Tea is the largest brand of tea in Ireland. And um, hilariously, if you go on the website, or well, the last time I looked at the website, it's now in my Unilever. The last time I read, they have the history of Lions Tea yeah. in Ireland. And it says it was created by this family, this Irish family called the Lionses, who are in Dublin. <laughs> so, <laughs> but there are, there are, which is funny, but um, they don't mention this German Jewish uh, immigrant family from Britain. No mentions of Hilarious. But um, there's other, there are other brands which still exist. Lions Made Ice Cream still exists. Uh, right. Uh, Wimpy obviously still exists. And uh, Tamar Hodes wants to know if the business still existed now, do you think you would want to be involved in it? You know, I think I would. I, I, I'm so, I, am a, I have an entrepreneurial spirit myself. I've had various businesses. And I think I would, I would really love to be involved. I think because they had this can do attitude, the idea, have a crazy idea, let it go, it won't work. But you know, it might work. And I think that would be terrific. I think it'd be tremendously exciting. And then also to work with your family, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a lovely idea. Of course, you know, it comes with consequences and it can be stressful and difficult and, and all those things. But I think, I think so, maybe. I would really like to, maybe in the ice cream I division. The idea of coming yes. out with new ice cream. Yes. How, ex ice cream. how exciting would that be? Yes, yes. Linda, no, what would no. your, if you, gonna, if you, Linda, if you are going to come up with ice cream, what would it be? What would be your? If I was going to come up with an ice cream? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it would require the following. Um, coffee. Ooh. Yes. And in the coffee, because this is something that I used to get at the Dairy Den in Bulawayo, which is not to do with the lion's ice, lion's made ice cream. Coffee ice cream with hunks of honeycomb. Oh, nice. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, and then chocolate over there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the coffee must be strong so okay. that it cuts the sweetness of the honeycomb. But, but yeah. Very you know, nice. They call it coffee crunch in Bulawayo. But coffee crunch. I, there we go. Yes. Yes, I just want there's some more questions and then I want to... No, okay. there are. There are That's more questions. I see them. Yep. Any more? Any yep, more there's more questions. questions. I can't if you, see. If you drag on the right-hand side, you'll see. I can, I can see some questions. Very clever here. man. This is what you need to know. Do you know... Oh, what does, what does your mum and your daughter... What do your mum and daughter think of your book? They were very, they're, they're very positive. They really enjoyed it. Uh, I think my daughter is... Uh, really like to understand the history of the family. And she's also loved meeting family members. You know, as I say, we didn't know any of these people. So, and some of these family members are quite interesting. You know, 
one of them is Nigella Lawson, and, and we have Dominic Lawson, who's uh, a journalist, and uh, George Monbiot, and uh, there's a woman who invented this incredible gluten-free bread called Lucinda, and there's a whole bunch of journalists and food people might, you know, so there's an opportunity to meet a whole, of course, with Insta family comes Insta family problems. <laughs> so, you know, it's not all plain sailing. Insta for <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, a question from Toby Schenker is what happened to Jay Lyons himself? Yeah, so he survived into the First World War and he was the front, very much the front man. And he would, he would tell everyone who would listen that he was the man behind Lyons and that would serve a really good purpose. That he, they called, he said he was a family member even though he wasn't. Uh, and, and he was much loved by Monty and the family. And then he died uh, during the First World War. Uh, he wasn't fighting, he was at home. Uh, but he didn't have any children. And so that was it. That was the end of his lineage. Okay. I have met some of his relatives, you know, through nephews and nieces, and they've been very supportive of the book and shared their stories. Yeah, yeah. Um, Galen Pinnock. Hello, Galen. I taught you when you were at Hertzlia School. Do you know if your ancestors, he's asking you this, do yes. you know if your ancestors had any misgivings about creating bombs to drop on Germany, the country they came from, despite the war effort? No. <laughs> in short <laughs> no i think i mean they were very committed they were very committed yeah. to stop nazi germany they yeah. they'd heard i mean just i mean because of my great grandfather was on the board of, uh, of deputies of jews around the world yeah. he'd heard all the intelligence reports about what was happening yes. uh, no they were and, and and actually he was on the list he found out later well he didn't find out because he died but family members found out but he was on the list when when the Nazis were going to come into Britain and they came to Jersey. Yes, yes. Um, but when they came to Britain, he was on this bla in this black book of one of the people would be rounded up. Yeah. So yeah. no, very yeah. much no. They, they had no misgivings. Yeah. Um, Hilton Gieschen. Hi, Hilton. Apologies if you've covered this. We joined late. How long did it take you to research your book and was the information readily available? Yes, yeah, so it took a couple of years and it, it's a great question because I was extraordinarily fortunate because when I started this project and I was very, you can imagine, I was very nervous because I don't pop up this part of the family, who am I? I'm an interloper, I'm younger. And I went to some of the elders, three, three of these men, and I said, look, what do you think of this idea? And they're like, yeah, this is a great idea. And not only that, they said, here's all the stuff. And it, my family, who were incredibly protective of their reputation, uh, and never had anything published, but they did have a lot of unpublished material. They had memoirs and letters, and, and they had uh, biographies, which never got published. They had the notes, they had minutes, they had, they had the minutes of the fund meeting. And they just said, here you go, here, here it is. So I was very fortunate with my timing, because 30 years earlier, somebody else wanted to write a book, and it was always decided, I mean, it's too early, we're too nervous about, you know, the wrong impression. So I was lucky with the timing. So, and of course, with the archives, because Lions was such a, had such an impact on society, for example, the picture archives were extraordinary, from the newspapers and, and the very, various other archives. I was, I was incredibly lucky for mm -hmm. sources. I had no problem. Doreen Gowans says to you, thank you for these memories. Oh, the Lions Corner House was a favorite meeting place for a bunch of us South Africans working in London in the late 1950s and early 1960s. The best Lions Corner House story is in a book, Africa House, when Gore Brown went back to England. Try and find it. Thank you very much. Thanks for the tip. I'm looking to see if there are any more questions. Um, oh, <laughs> Yvonne Javits says, I love the interview, but I wanted to say hello to Linda. I'm from Bulawayo and I love the Dairy Den. Do you remember Lions Made Hits of the Week? <laughs> okay, um, any, any further questions, anybody? Yes, there's oh, one at the bottom. Did anyone emerge strongly, asks Toby Schenker, as the black sheep of the family? <laughs> Somehow, yes, there is... seems to be a badass <laughs> lurking in these successful family lineage histories. So the answer is yes. I mean, I think Gluck was certainly yes. in the 1920s was one. Yeah. And then more yeah. recently, the son of the chairman, yeah. um, uh, this is 1970s, yeah. decided that he wanted to set up a business. He was, you know, he wanted to be like his ancestors. He wanted to um, show everybody that he also could create an empire. Unfortunately, his choice was to set up a, 
empire based on bill of, of making manufacturing illegal drugs, A class drugs, speed. And he was arrested in Scotland um, with all the chemicals and it became front, front page news. Uh, he was called the wimpy bar kid. And he was very, you know, for him, sadly put away for eight years. He had eight years in prison. I mean, he deserved it. He admits he deserved it. Uh, so yeah, so there were some people, you know, there were other people who, you know, they struggled with uh, the constrictions. And so I think, you know, they, and then they would just go off. They would have nothing to do with the family. They wouldn't talk to anybody and they would go into the arts or they'd go into, you know, business, but have nothing to do. So there was definitely, when I was one of the great, things I enjoyed was calling people up for the book. And I spoke to maybe 60 or 70 people said, Hey, my name's Thomas. I'm Belinda's son, Sam and Wendy's grandson. You don't know me. I'm one of your cousins, but what are your memories? And there'd be very different responses. Some would be very nostalgic, very harking back to the wonderful times in the wimpy bars or the corner houses or, you know, some of their lifestyles to get a wonderful lifestyle. But other people are like, uh, uh, I don't want anything to do with that. So I think there were definitely differences, um, but there were commonalities and there was a love, the, the, the striking commonality was this appreciation of family, of unity, of family values. And that's really come down the generations. Um, Aaron Gersh wants to know, were any, were any of the family stuck in Germany and murdered by the Nazis? Not that I know of. So this family really got out of Central Europe, Western Europe in the 1840s, 1850s. So the answer is no. They, some died in the Second World War fighting. And some in Italy, some in Germany. Uh, not in Germany, sorry. Some in Italy and some in France. Uh, but no, not, I mean, in terms of close family, not that I know of. My, um, very sadly, on my father's side, uh, we lost five members uh, of the family. And... When I was researching House by the Lake, uh, I mean, this is a different story, but when I was researching House by the Lake, the family story was we all survived. This was definitely the family that my grandparents told me, my, my father told me. And then he sent me this family tree. And I said, Dad, there's something weird about it. There's a bunch of people whose names, they don't have any death date. He said, oh, well, they went to Central America or they went to South America. And I said, okay. So I went, I looked it up and very sadly, you know, on Yad Vashem database, they, they they had died and but i thought that was really interesting from the family story point of view that my grandparents had chosen not to tell their children mm. you know they didn't want them to know they wanted to put a line under it um and so then when we found out of course it not only was it is it shocking and incredibly sad but it also shifted the whole image that we had of ourselves as we were the lucky ones we were the survivors mm. the survivors yeah yeah um, Lydia Abel says, you have such a way with words. It's a real Thank treat you. to listen to you talking about this fascinating family history. And at this point, I want to say, and I'm going to say it again, Thomas, this should be made into a series. It's about awesome. the rise and fall of the British Empire. It's about how Jewish people contributed to, to, the, to what, how Britain sees itself. And it's not known and not many people well i shouldn't say that many people will read your book more people would watch your book so i'll work with you on a screenplay fantastic look forward to it and if there's any <laughs> directors or producers out there <laughs> yes let's do something fantastic. yeah i think it would be amazing have Thank i you, asked Linda. all the questions um is there anyone who feels i haven't i'm just looking Looking, looking, yeah, I think I've answered all the questions. Um, and I think, Beryl, it's time for you to come in and perhaps wrap up. Thomas, it's been wonderful as always. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm so glad everybody was here and, and shared this with us and got to know you like I've gotten to know you over the past few weeks. Thank you, Linda. Feels like we've known each other forever. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you. Thank you so very much, Linda and Thomas. What an inspired conversation. And, and I very luckily also remember the Lion's Corner House. It was, it was a favorite haunt when we went to London in the 50s. It was wonderful and, and is imprinted on my memory forever. And yes, Linda, I agree with you. Uh, a series would be fantastic. So thank you to everybody. Thank you very much to our, uh, our interviewer, Linda, and to Thomas for being such a wonderful storyteller, and to the J Lions family, to the whole family for what they gave us as a legacy. 
Um, if you want to get the book, please contact the Book Lounge on booklounge at gmail.com or call them on 021-462-2425 to arrange a pickup or delivery. To our audience, thank you so much for your support of the Jewish Literary Festival, to the sponsors and donors of JLF 2020, to Natasha Skorik for her absolutely brilliant technical coordination, our very grateful thanks. A reminder to watch your email inbox and diarize next Wednesday, the 27th of May at eight o'clock for our next webinar when Johnny Steinberg will be talking to Jonathan Anser about Johnny's book, One Day in Bethlehem. We look forward to your joining us again. Good night, stay safe and see you next week. There was someone I'd been seeking And the moment we got speaking I could tell at sight it must be you Such a sweet thrill went right through me And a kind fate sent love to me For I knew at sight it must be you And as soon as I had met